Hey, welcome to iFanboy, the video podcast from the comic book discussion site iFanboy.com. Uh, I am Josh, and uh, this is Connor. Hello. And uh, we're here with Darwin Cook. Hey, good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, in lovely, lovely, rainy San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Windy, um, rainy. San windy San and rainy. Francisco. And in the... Low, low 50s? No, the room. Oh, we are, well, <laughs> it's very early and we're all kind of beat. Uh, I, was, it's, I was remarking, you're a fantastic designer and artist and we put you in the ugliest room on the face of the earth. Yeah, I was saying this carpet reminds me of that scene in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and right this morning is right about the right time for this carpet to start crawling away on us. <laughs> so, um, I thought it was interesting that when you, you started out wanting to get into comics, but your style wasn't what people wanted. So you went into animation, which sort of helped propel your style to become acceptable, the popularity of the animation. Sort of a secure, circuitous route to get into comics. Everything for me has been that way. Uh, to be quite honest, it's, it's been really weird. I have a lot of young talent will come up to me at the shows, and they, they want to know what my formula was uh, for breaking in. And I said, gee, I don't know, uh, tie your work to a stone and throw it off the roof of a building and see what happens. Because, I, you know, uh, I had pitched Ego, I guess, in 94. Batman Ego was, was my first graphic novel for DC Comics. And while they kind of appreciated the work, it was right in the middle of the image boom. Right. Which is as far from your style as you can get. So there were guys who appreciated the work, but nobody was buying. And uh, four years went by. And in that four years time that passed, I had managed to hook up with the guys in Warner Brothers. And I'd done a sample for Bruce. Uh, Bruce Tim. Yes, Bruce Tim over at Warner's Animation. And uh, he loved the sample, so they hired me. And I was like, well, forget about DC Comics, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm at Warner's now working on the greatest Batman interpretation I think there's ever been. Yep. And. Uh, I guess it was my second year in at Warner's. I get a phone call one day, and they're like, hey, uh, yeah, I found this submission of yours. Uh, I was throwing out a bunch of stuff, and I found this thing. Do you still want to do this book? And they didn't know I was working at Warner's. Oh, they didn't? No. It was like, and that's the funniest part, is none of this was connected in any way. And so all of a sudden, four years later, uh, okay, I'm, I'm doing the book, and we were kind of off and running. So there's, I have no formula for success. It, it's just the most <laughs> random thing. Well, and speaking of success, um, New Frontier, especially I think 06 was really, with the Absolute Edition, really people really started to embrace it. Mm, thanks. When, you, when, you're make, when you're making New Frontier or, or, or writing it, do you have any inkling at all that this is going to be this huge success? Absolutely not. And did, did it, was it were, you, I mean, were you completely floored by that? Yeah, it actually, uh, I'll tell you, last night at James Symes' store sort of culminated in my stupefaction over the whole thing. I, I think we've all been blindsided by the degree to which the book seems to have, um, yeah. We should, we should quickly explain to the viewers that the reason why we're all a little groggy was last night was the premiere of the animated adaption of New Frontier, the New Frontier and then there was an after party. Uh, at, a, at a place in San Francisco, so there's, that's why we're a little bit... There was a crazy <laughs> party last night at uh, the Isotope Lounge. The, and it was it was so packed full of people. That's uh, I was saying as we were coming down, uh, I had talked Bruce Tim into coming to the party, and uh, we pulled up and we saw the crowd, and it, like neither one of us can, can really deal with that kind of thing. It was It's like, oh my God. And when we walked in, we just went, oh no. <laughs> Uh, you know, it thinned out just enough, though, <laughs> within an hour that, that, that it, yeah, it was fantastic. But at first we were like, oh, my God, look at all these people. Uh, so, yeah. So, so like, even, even after having the animated film produced and made and everything, it was just seeing all the people that... You never really, again, uh, you know, you put your best foot forward. But up until the movie premiered, mm-hmm. you know, it's just a bunch of guys who are involved in it. Yeah. Glad-handing each other about the job, you know. Mm-hmm. So until you've seen the reaction of, of actual humans. Well, to talk about the, the book specifically, I think sure. the thing for me and, and, and you know, I fanboy and a lot of the people who watch the show is that uh, your interpretations of the characters seem to have been sort of the, the best that anybody's done with, for example, Hal Jordan in a really long time. Yeah. I mean, were you feeling, was that something you were trying to fill in, like, like I can do the, the, the great Hal Jordan or, or the great... I will admit, I sort of had this feeling that I was going to avenge him with this story because of mm-hmm. all the, you know, 
incredibly convoluted and, and sort of horrible things that had been propagated in the last, say, 10 years, mm -hmm. since Emerald Dawn on, I suppose. And yeah, I, I always looked at him as, as a classic example of, uh, you know, lazy writing. <laughs> <laughs> Just guys stopped caring about him as a character and they stopped trying to make it interesting. And then inertia keeps it going for 10 years. And then one day nobody cares about this character, so it's like, mm -hmm. let's turn him into a murderer. Let's make him a drunk, you know, let's, let's, and he becomes a plot device. And I thought that was sort of a horrible way to, to wrap it up with him. Uh, the only problem was I couldn't do a story like that that took place today. Mm -hmm. Because of all the continuity, I had to go all the way back to the beginning to find a clean stretch of road with those characters where, uh, you know, I wouldn't have to deal with all of that kind of stuff. If, if, you, if, if, if someone didn't know what New Frontier is, how would you, how would you explain it to, to a new reader? Well, the one sentence pitch line is, it's the right stuff for superheroes, basically. I think, I think we've mentioned that on yeah. way back, yeah. Um, do you think that people really responded to the work because there's something missing in the current modern style of comics? There's something pure about the Silver Age, Dawn of the Silver Age? Era. I don't know if it's missing, but my my opinion is it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I'll be straight up honest. And again, I have I have a lot of respect for uh, what uh, you know my my contemporaries do. But I'm sorry, there is absolutely no reason in the world there should be anything but an all ages Superman story. Mm -hmm. There should be no other type. Period. And if you haven't got the imagination or the skill to craft a good story within that, that framework, then you shouldn't be working on the character. I, I don't think these characters were built to, to carry these adult themes. And while they can, mm -hmm. um, this whole notion, and I, I hate to bring it down to like marketing terms, but you have a brand and your brand has a certain value and a certain equity and a certain access to, to a market. And the minute you start tampering with the brand you're destroying it's it's you know the goodwill it's built up over 60 70 years mm -hmm. and one day you can't go back and all of a sudden the irony is going to be that all of these characters that were created to entertain and inform younger people are going to be hands off to younger people and they're not accessible anymore exactly yeah now you're 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 putting out another New Frontier piece, so one shot's coming out. That's right. Was what was the inspiration to come back to that? Was it at all daunting considering the success of the first, well, the original? Yeah. We, we discussed it many different ways, and uh, it's daunting in the sense that, gosh, I could do New Frontier stories for thirty years, mm. to be quite honest. But will you? No, no, <laughs> no. As John Stewart says, I'm not your monkey. <laughs> um, no, the problem is. Uh, you can get really worried when you've done something right that you could screw it up by going in to tamper with it, you know? Um, I call it Muhammad Ali syndrome, like just mm -hmm. not knowing when to stop, you know? Or Sylvester Stallone syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, honestly, Rocky's uh, what, what, one of the most famous, brilliant movies ever made, and then, and then you just beat the hell out of the brand with all the junk. It that still dilutes the power of the original. It, absolutely. And Rocky so too was okay. Hey, I, almost every one of the movies has some sort of merit to it, but ultimately what happens is it, it makes the brand, you know, or the movie, the, the piece of work that actually started it all, is its values diluted by You don't think of Rocky as being the Oscar winning, you know, Oscar yeah. winning film, you think of the ridiculousness of the, the sequels. You see Dolph Lundgren and yeah. Mr. T and all that nonsense, you know, yeah, you don't think about what a powerful, wonderful film it was. So I'm very worried about the notion of going back into it in a big way mm -hmm. but it's a lot of fun to dip in with with a couple little stories did you have a favorite um character or, that you had in new frontiers uh, interpretation maybe the way you drew them or, or the storyline you came up for them was, was there a favorite piece in there that there's quite a few actually but one of the ones that i still love to see the reaction to is you know of course wonder woman yeah and certainly if there has been difficulty with New Frontier from the get-go in terms of a visual sense, it was their inability to, to sort of, you know, appreciate, I'll say, <laughs> my interpretation of Wonder Woman. And um, 
as usual, you know, the readership speaks, right? And they love her. Yeah. You know, you've got this little percentage of guys who go, why is she so big? But generally, people just love the she's, take on She's it. powerful. So it's been a lot of fun for me to watch DC and Warners have to embrace <laughs> that take on the character because she's such a, an important part of the, you know, the story itself. So I'd say, yeah, she's definitely the one. Now, in, in taking the book to the, to the animated realm, um, would, did they present that idea to you? Did it something you were involved in from the beginning? Well, no, these things happen, right? right. This is a large company. And they make these decisions completely independently mm -hmm. of us. Uh, however, the minute they knew they were going forward, they called me. Greg Novak at DC called me up, and uh, they wanted me involved from the very beginning. And uh, I, I didn't want to be actually. You know, <laughs> really? Least. Well, animation—it literally takes maybe what a thousand, fifteen hundred people mm. to come together in a unified fashion to, to execute something like this. And and then they're all involved in your work now. Mm, I just didn't see it happening. You know, I didn't, see, I didn't see it coming together the way I would have been happy with it. And if there's one thing I've learned about New Frontier, it doesn't matter what it is about it. I'm associated with it. My name's kind of on the brand. And I have the choice of either staying completely away from something like that mm -hmm. so I can say, hey, that has nothing to do with my Yeah, down the wall. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, maybe not that vehement <laughs> about it, but not like they should all, whoa, just, you know, no, they're doing their thing and it'll be their interpretation and that'll be great. Um, but once the team started coming together, that was the thing that, that really did. Once Bruce Tim. Yeah, Bruce, you know, uh, I've worked with Bruce before um, and once I knew it went into his studio, and then I saw the guys who were being brought in on the project, like David Bullock, the director. He's one of my best friends. And we've all worked together. We, we speak the same language. There's no getting to know each other. We understand that we all agree on the rules of good animation. There's no argument in regards to all these things. Then it became really attractive to me to want to be involved, because I knew I was dealing with guys who, who get it. And... Uh, once Dave and I piled in with Bruce, then every guy in the city <laughs> kind of kind of said, "Man, let me in on this thing." So we we had this incredible crew, a bunch of guys who've who've moved on from this type of thing, came back uh, to work on the movie. It was really really uh, you know. Flat. It sounds rewarding. The, the experience sound, it seems like it, everyone's really happy with it. It's tough, you know. Like Bruce and I are both fighters. You know, we're both stubborn people. We both really believe in, in you know, our, our approach to things. So there'd be issues where we'd butt heads. But that's part of the process, you know. So there, there's a lot of push and pull mm -hmm. as, as you go. But, yeah, very rewarding. And, and actually, you know, just a kick to be working with old friends that I hadn't worked with in, you know, over eight years now. So are you happy with the final product? I mean, is it... Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a two-part question. Are you mostly happy with the final product? I'm not happy with anything. <laughs> well, you that's know. good. I mean, most this, artists will tell you, you you're never fully happy with your work. Part of the process is, uh, you know, the day you're looking at your own work going, gee whiz, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. You're probably done. <laughs> uh, so for me, everything is a process of, you know, oh, you know, that could have been better. And it, you're constantly examining the work for its weaknesses, trying to figure out the ways, you know, next time you can make it stronger. So on that level, all I see are flaws. Right. And, but that's, that's Bruce, myself, David, the director. That's what we're trained to do. Mm -hmm. As a viewer, to sit down and watch it, absolutely, it's a home run. Right. Was there anything in the movie that, that you adapted, that you, like there was something in the book that you thought you could have done better that you, that you changed in the movie, or is it, is it a straight... I, I believe there are a lot of little pieces of the film that, that sort of uh, handle certain aspects of the book in a really, say, more succinct and, and, and compressed dramatic fashion that I thought was really kind of good. I thought uh, the way Stan constructed the uh, first scene with Martian Manhunter was really well done. It sort of said everything about the character all in one, one little vignette. Um, well, I don't necessarily think it's, it's kind of apples and oranges, which is better. I got a real kick out of them uh, putting Hal on the rocket. 
-hmm. in the movie yep. for the scene with Flag. And the minute I saw how, how exciting and dramatic that was going to be, I thought, wow, that's a brilliant move. Now, I don't know that I would have changed my book back, uh, but it definitely, it definitely makes for a more exciting end to the second act of the film. Well, it's, 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 it's a phenomenon that we haven't seen in a while in comics. I mean, the New Frontier, um, I've, I don't know if I've met anyone yet who's, who we've exposed to the book and has not really loved it. So I, I think it's something to be very proud of. I think there's people who hate it, but they're at a point now where they, they won't say that anymore. <laughs> you know, they keep it themselves, but they're going, God, I hate that book. What's a big deal? <laughs> now, if we can switch gears a little to The Spirit, which sure. was your other big project and which we also all loved, um, what, what brought you to The Spirit? I mean... Because that's a, that's a daunting thing to have to the tackle, I The big black car drove me out to Wildwood <laughs> Cemetery, and I was held in front of this <laughs> big hole in the ground. They put a gun to my head. <laughs> um, the spirit came right out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a call from Mark Chirello at uh, DC, and they were going forward with this book. And again, none of these projects are contingent on creative involvement. Mm -hmm. Once they're going ahead, they're going ahead, and they're going with or without you. Right. And that's how, you know, like even Batman Beyond, that's how it ended up existing. They were doing it whether we liked it or not. So it was, it was up to Bruce to come up with a good idea for it, or it was, it was going to happen anyway. So they were doing the book, and they, they wanted me to do it. And I, at first I said I didn't think so mm -hmm. because, you know, come on, what are you doing? Stepping in the footsteps of giants. The way I say it, it's like, yeah, you know, okay, some idiots might think that you've got to remake Psycho shot for shot. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not one of them. That's just, you know, it's ridiculous. But after a couple of days uh, of thinking about it, it occurred to me, as long as it was placed in the present day, that gave me 50 mm. years of social trends and things that have come about that Will didn't have to, to work with. And frankly, trying to do the spirit in the period, like consistently, forget it. Right. There's so many stories, you, you name it, any type of story done any type of way, they did it. So in order for it to be a fresh challenge and not just a rehash, I thought, geez, if we're in the present world, there's a whole new set of circumstances we could put them in. That would work for me. And then, you know, when I phoned them and said, can we do this with it? Um, they, they were happy to do it that way. And uh, then I got excited about it because I wouldn't just be echoing or mimicking his work as much as I could sort of add to to it with some of the things that have happened in the last, you know, little while. As well as expose a lot of people who, who haven't ever read The Spirit and say, you should now go check out, you this, know, the original. This has a lot to do with why we stuck to Done and Ones. Yep. And we tried to hit a variety of tones as we went, was we wanted new readers. You know, I, I'll be honest, I considered the old readers a captive audience to one degree or another. They were going to pick it up if they liked what I did great and if they didn't they were going to not pick it up so to me the issue was always new readers and that's why we ended up with yet yeah, one issue stories things you can pick up and put down with a sense of completion you know we built a bit of continuity over the year mm -hmm. with with the world but we wanted to make sure it was accessible and easy easy for uh, everybody to sort of jump onto the spirit seems very unique in the, in, the, in the traditional noir leading male character, at least amongst the modern heroes, how would you describe Denny Cole to people? Like his attitude towards towards what he does? Oh, okay. Uh, he's he's not stronger. He's just willing to hang on longer. <laughs> you know, he's not smarter. He's just willing to put more time into it. <laughs> Denny's just, um, he's an average guy, I believe. Uh, he He's not the brightest guy in the world. He's not the dumbest, he's an average guy. And he has a thirst for adventure. I think something that isn't really touched on anywhere is kind of like the perverse nature of Denny Cole. <laughs> and I don't mean that in any salacious way, but here's a guy who at the age of 25, after being killed, comes back to life. And he comes up with this idea of, oh, man, wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to pay taxes? <laughs> I could just chase these guys and not worry about the rules. And, you know, 
he was an adventurer. I think mm-hmm. he was a guy who was up for anything, you mm-hmm. know, and whatever came his way, he was like, okay, I'm down with that. Let's try that or let's go with that. And I think that's what I loved about him is he's not a genius. He doesn't have any superpowers. And quite often his, his thirst for uh, adventure, uh, you know, gets him in over his head. Mm-hmm. Did, you have, did you have a favorite issue that you, from the run? It's so difficult to, to choose because mm-hmm. the, they were tonally so different. Right. Um, so it is a tough question. I think if I had to choose, it's probably between, and this is just for me personally, sure. Uh, number four, mm-hmm. pork and beans. Okay. Oh, no, that was number five. Exactly. <laughs> Spirit pork and beans with carrion. Or uh, number 10, the um, Rush Limbaugh is the uh, Rosie O'Donnell, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, schizophrenic uh, killer thing. Let me, let me, uh, I guess sort of technically when, when I'm a reader and I'm looking at the pages, uh, the, the title page, are those something that do you do those take a long time of planning or or you know you go over them again and again are those difficult or they come kind of easy it uh, you know it really varied issue to issue some of them were there in my head the minute uh, I knew what the story would be sometimes that image would drive uh, the notion of where I was going with the story the silk satin story for example in issue four was built backwards from the notion of them being handcuffed in the desert mm. and that splash image and that whole first page lead-in was really what I had for the characters, was that uh, somebody's bitching about the person they're dragging along, and you assume it's Denny bitching about this woman, <laughs> and then you turn the page and you find out it's actually the woman bitching about Denny. And <laughs> that, that splash was in my head uh, when I thought of the moment. And then there were ones where, yeah, it took forever to construct them uh, because I knew what it had to say, but I couldn't figure out how. So. It all depended. So you're you're a writer artist um, working on a monthly book. How long does it take you to to do thirty pages or twenty, however many pages, twenty two pages, twenty two pages? Yeah, yeah, we do, and yeah, we had to do it every month. Um, <laughs> we, that, you know, and look, kids, don't let anybody tell you different. Okay, the reason these things don't get done in time is because they don't work on them. It's not because it's impossible. It's not because the guys. <laughs> putting so much into it that it just can't be done, okay? They're just not working at speed, all right? And I'm sorry, guys, but that's the truth, admit it. Uh, <laughs> so does the work ethic come from being an animation, from not going right into comics, the, the, the ethic to get it done every month? No, it, it goes just, way further. It goes way just, back. It goes back to like caddying and golf courses when I was 13 mm-hmm. to get money for comics and uh, all the way through. One thing about comics is it's become less of an industry and more of a cottage industry, Mm -hmm. I will say, which is to say all the people involved in the direct market love it, know it for what it is, and make allowances for things like lateness Mm -hmm. or, you know, et cetera. In the real world, come on. (laughs) You work at Time Magazine and you go into the publisher and you go, hey, man, you know, we're just not going to ship tomorrow. I'm going to be two days late. You fire the street, buddy. Yeah. There's, no, there's no talk. There's no discussion. You're gone. That's, that's what monthly publishing is. You're there every month, come hell or high water. And uh, we blew it. Uh, the problem was it got insane during the New Frontier movie right. because I was working full time on both projects. Oh. So there, there was a four-month period where I was putting writing and drawing the monthly spirit, including doing the covers and coloring the covers and the whole nine, and working on the movie. So how, how long were your days then? 16 hours to 20 hours, depending. And like seven days a week, it rolled like that for... There were at least two months where it rolled like that, and I started getting these blinding headaches. <laughs> yeah. It was just crazy, and then I, end, I finally found out I needed glasses. <laughs> I finally broke my eyes. <laughs> so, it's a painful way to find out. So, yeah, you know, it was, it was a lot of work last year, and, yeah, we did. We screwed up. Um, there was one month where we blew it, and, it, you know, it's funny because what can throw you off, you never know what it will be, and in issue 10... We had the momentum to make it all the way to the year at that point, and the movie had just closed out, so I was exhausted, but I could see the light. And then with number 10, the legal department came in Hmm. and made all kinds of idiotic notes on the book. And they were were idiotic. 
admit it, guys. <laughs> Honestly. And I refused to change it because it was, it wasn't being changed for any real legal reason I could see. It was just they were, they were augmenting what I had done to, to their taste, so I wouldn't do it. And that led to the editor rewriting uh, parts of 10. And that took the wind out of all of our sails yeah. at that point. And we actually lost two weeks there as we, we tried to recover from the fact that this was happening. And there'd been so much work. Yeah, that I, I, I ended up blowing two weeks. And the next thing you know, we were a month late on the last book, right? So I felt bad about that because I wanted it to be a full year mm -hmm. every time right out. But we did our best. We got to 12 and then it kind of... So do you have something come um, Do you have... Uh books in the works? Do you have pl your plans or in place for your next works? Or, or are you just going to take the next couple of years off and recuperate? Or? <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, I don't think I could. I really do enjoy it. And it's funny because when I do have downtime, uh, then, you know, then I'm working on my house. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I find I have to burn my creative energy every day one way or another. Um, but it would be nice to just do that on the beach with my finger for a month or so. <laughs> but no, I'm actually taking a, a fair chunk of time off right now. Um, I'm just going to go to some shows and enjoy, uh, you know, all, all of this uh, that's going on. And then next year, the only, the only firm thing on my schedule right now is I'm doing a Jonah Hex with uh, my buddies Jimmy and, and oh, Justin. Man. <laughs> we that's one of our favorite books see Jimmy Jimmy and Justin are very good friends of mine and uh, they were after me since Jonas kicked up and right. I've just been too busy and then in San Diego this year uh, Justin and I were out drinking one night he's like Hex you know how do I get you into Hex I said what are you stupid I'm Canadian <laughs> give me a story where he goes to Canada <laughs> I'm going to go across that New York state border into Canada I said, you know, maybe give me some Mounties, but not those guys in the red coats that right. you all think are right. around our woods. Oh, they don't? Give me those vino, whiskey-soaked, you know, <laughs> douchebags that, that were out there in the, in the woods. You know, let, let's really do it. Let's show people the other side of, 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 of all of that. And I said, and don't give me any nonsense. Make sure you research it. What's going on and on. I'm just piling it on, thinking this will keep them off my back for a few months. And then, yeah, they turned around and wrote this brilliant script that, that incorporated everything I'd asked for. So it was like, okay, I guess we're doing Jonah Hex. So is that in 08 or, or 09? I should be out in June. Oh, wow. Uh, are, are you interested going forward in doing other kinds of genres? Because one of the things that's great about Jonah Hex is that in the midst of all the superhero books and all this stuff, like it's so good to see a, just a, a classic Western book. And, you know, there's all sorts of other books that can be done. There is absolutely no, it's, it's no mistake that you'll notice most of my work revolves around Batman, Catwoman, Slam Bradley, the Spirit. No superheroes. They're all people. And even New Frontier, you'll notice that the periods where you see the metas go is, have been compressed into as tight a space as I possibly could because I just have way more interest in, in uh, what I'll call human heroism. I'm, you know, to me, Superman's always been a cheat. I never warmed up to the character because, yeah, well, sure, you're a hero. Look at you. You know, it's easy to be a hero when you can't be hurt. Uh, and I've never, I've never really appreciated the, the immense burden that Superman carries around. You know, I, I look at all these uh, normal characters and I think, wow, they're, they're, you know, there's a far more heroic journey they're on because, you know, they're mortal. They can be, they can be hurt. Well, the Green Lantern ring is pretty powerful, though. Yes, it is. <laughs> And again, you will notice that uh, in Frontier, we wait all the way to the bloody end before uh, I let that become an issue in mm -hmm. Hell's life. Because, yeah, at that point, things do take off in another direction. And I was far more interested in him as a person than I was in, in how many ways I could make green light look cool, you know, <laughs> um, grabbing things and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to um, end by asking, what is it about comics that are so satisfying? Because you, you could work in other mediums. Why is, why, is it com why, why comics? Why, do you, why is it, what is it about comics? I think what's great about comics is uh, you have the ability to put together an actual finished piece of entertainment with the fewest number of people touching it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it can be as close to, to what you feel is right as, as possible. Um, animation can be very rewarding. 
But unless you're Bruce Tim, yeah. it's an anonymous right. uh, effort. You're very well paid and you have all the respect to your peers, but your work goes unnoticed. And at some point, you know, every artist wants to, wants to be able to claim ownership of his work and, mm -hmm. and, and be known for it. So comics afford you that opportunity. And while the direct market maybe isn't growing by leaps and bounds every month, the people who read them are spread out all over the media now. Last week, the Wall Street Journal called me wow. to do an interview about New Frontier. And I said, well, <laughs> why? <laughs> and, uh, the writer said, you know, dude, I just, I think my editor's a fan. I, mm. think, I think he wanted to get this into the, into the paper because he, he, he loves it. And yeah, it was in yesterday's uh, pick section of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> that's, oh, that's great. <laughs> buy it all, buy them, buy them. <laughs> this must be, you must, uh, it must be a bit of a whirlwind, this whole New Frontier explosion in the last... It's actually not been a whirlwind, it's more like a slow motion yeah. sort of thing. Um, because it has now, for me, it's been, it's getting on nine years mm -hmm. that I've been living with New Frontier. So I'm seeing it unspool. And this last bit's been a hell of a whirlwind. Yeah. Like yesterday, I mean, it, yeah, I, I stood it's, up. In the crowd was shocking. Yeah. And I looked around and I, it's, it, you know, it begins to sink in. You, holy geez, people do care. And, you know, you have guys like Phil Morris coming up to you and going, you're Darwin Cook. <laughs> <laughs> you just think, wow, I guess, I guess, uh, yeah, this is something else. And then the party last night just finished it. You know, it was like, wow. So, yeah, it did kind of. That kind of did catch me by mm -hmm. surprise. Well, you certainly deserve all. I mean, all the accolades you've, you've received. It's, it's a fantastic piece of, piece of comics, and I'm starting to feel guilty about that now. You know, <laughs> I'm starting to think. Well, I'm starting to think of all the guys who created the characters, and it's right. like I, I'm. I'm thinking I got to start shifting all the fucking credit over <laughs> soon because I'm starting to feel guilty. We'll, we'll give Dave Stewart. Uh, it was a J Bone. Um, did he dink that? He he did the spirit. Your anchor was Jay and Dave and Jared Fletcher. We've right. been a team now for five solid years i guess yeah. and yeah geez i mean those guys that they're, they're half of it right like yeah. i i think i was the first guy to get my colorist on the cover with me mm -hmm. as as my my primary collaborator like on new frontier uh, and I, I think it's even in the spirit especially like his colors i added a lot to the book as well i mean you, we talked i think it was the fourth issue the desert issue I yes. mean, that was i've never seen coloring like that david so. is is half the equation when when we're sitting there putting the artwork together it's like in a film sound is half of it you know and nobody wants to admit that because all the effort goes into shooting the visuals mm -hmm. but so yeah my line art is my line art but look at what dave does with it you know mm -hmm. it's uh yeah he's definitely this whole notion of colorist uh, He's an artist in his own right, and you know everything he's brought to to this work. It's as much his as mine. Great. Uh, I think we need to all go take a nap and have some vitamin C and get you out of this horrid room now. So uh, God bless you, fair boys. <laughs> Thanks a lot, and uh, we'll be looking out for whatever comes next. Thanks very much, guys. It was great coming down and talk to you. I appreciate I, it. Even, I wish it was a little later. <laughs> pow. These are Darwin Cook toys from the New Frontier. Pow, pow, biff, pow. You just said Biff Pow. Bam. <laughs> so we want to thank Darwin Cook for uh, taking the time Absolutely. to sit with us. That's a lot of fun. It was. Uh, if you have any questions, you can write to contact at ifanboy.com. Or if you want to leave us a voicemail, you can call 1-888-FANBOYS, which is 326-2697. And you can get over to the iFanboy site uh, at ifanboy.com where you can have a discussion about this show or there's all sorts of other content and stuff going on. And then you can get over to revision3.com slash ifanboy for more videos and uh, links to the forums there. So thanks very much. Yeah.